So hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today and talk a bit about our work on identity provisioning to SGX uh, workloads. And of course, to start, I would like to tell a few things about Intel SGX. So it is a trust execution environment and the goal of a trust execution environment is to create an area where code is protected from other pieces of code. And in this case, with SGX, you want to protect not only from other SGX code, but also from higher privilege code, like the hypervisor, the operating system, the, the buyers, and anything else. And you can use Intel SGX on processors that support it. And there are VMs or bare metals available in several cloud providers. Right, so once you have this piece of code running in a, in a uh, protected from other pieces of code, then you have this, everything that one process does is encrypted. And besides that, there is another feature that is very interesting, especially for us, which is the uh, capability of attesting the, the code. So in the attestation process, it includes not only the measurement of the code that was loaded, and some other things that were used to create this enclave, so to say, but also uh, includes information from the platform. For example, the, the firmware version that was used, uh, if hyper-threading was enabled, if it is a, a debug mode or production mode enclave. And once you have this measurement of the application, and you have the information on the, on the platform security. This is packed in something that we call the quote. So the quote is produced by this quote enclave. And once you have this quote in hand, you can verify it either using an Intel service or using uh, the data center attestation primitives, which is something that you can install locally. So um, with this very basic concepts. Uh, we should think now about how do you develop code for Intel SGX. And the first approach is not the most exciting one, is the one that you, you need to use when you want to the most flexibility, you want to minimize your trust computing base, you want to minimize the usage of the protected memory. And that means that you will probably be writing from scratch using C or C++. Your trusted code cannot do system calls and you have to implement yourself attestation and mitigations for vulnerability. So this is something that is hard and not very uh, feasible most of the times. So there is a, another approach, which is the uh, known lift and shift. And in this case, you use uh, some runtime to put the complete service that you develop, the complete workload inside SGX. And that means that in the, in the happy path, what happens is that you can uh, just change your base container and then you can, uh, you change your base container and then you, I, I see that I don't have a camera now. I don't know what happened. Maybe it works, yeah, um, sorry. In the happy path, you change your base container and then you just uh, re-execute, build your container again and everything works. In the less lucky path, what happens is that you may need to recompile your application or maybe you need to use uh, alternative packages or, or libraries, for example, from a different uh, Linux distribution. But it's easier, much easier. You don't have to rewrite your code and when you do that, although you need a bit more uh, protected memory and you use a bit more of your uh, protected uh, memory and your trusted computing base, you do inherit a few things that can be done in the runtime. So for example, if you implement security mitigations on the runtime, this can be inherited by the applications running on top of those runtime, right? And regarding the, the protected memory, according to some recent announcements from, from Intel, that should not be an issue early next year. Okay, and then so just to give you an example about uh, how you can port your application, this is uh, an example of a happy path. So you just have your Docker file, 
with uh, Python base image and then you replace your base image and then everything should work. So in this case, what happens is that the, the new image has a version of Python that was recompiled with the, the runtime. And in this case, we are using the SCON runtime, a set of tools that enable the compilation and the execution of, of SGX workloads. In another way to do that, the, the second example, then you could have uh, a microservice written in another language like C or even Fortran, and, and then you can recompile it using the, the two set. In this case, I used another uh, base image. Okay, so here we, we follow this lift and shift approach because it, we think it's more realistic. And if we think now about uh, why we were we want to integrate uh, SGX and Spiffy, then uh, the first thing to talk about is that we can have a more aggressive uh, threat model. So a threat model where the, the attacker can have uh, super user privileges, and this can happen for several reasons. The, the operator may be forced to give this access to someone. The attacker could have stolen the credentials from the, the infrastructure operators, or something may be uh, compromised in the infrastructure. So once he or she, the attacker has that, uh, can do anything he or she wants, right? So can replace components, can dump the memory, and that's the kind of thing we are looking at. But one thing that I would like to take out of the discussion now is that let's assume that the SGX itself is free of bugs. So the, the processor is free of bugs, the runtime and the libraries, and also that the, the workload doesn't have some silly API that exposes everything uh, without authentication. And lastly, I'm also assuming that the Spire server will be trusted. So there will be no one issuing uh, IDs uh, for other workloads that are not the, the, the SGX ones. So with this uh, threat model in mind, there is a, a clear motivation to do this integration. So uh, the very basic one is if you have a set of services that you trust, then maybe now you can be more open to services that are running on a remote infrastructure that you do not trust if they are running uh, inside SGX. And then you can, you do not need to make your application more com complex. You just uh, give them IDs that reflect this uh, status. The other thing is the, exactly the opposite. Maybe you have some SGX workloads and you want to make them talk to non-SGX workloads, but you want at least some evidence that they are on a reasonable platform. So for example, that they are on the, the correct cloud provider in the correct security group, as you do normally with uh, spiffy identities. And the last one is something that I consider very interesting and promising, is that you, uh, you could actually put small ghost tunnels inside your application. So for example, uh, because you have to, anyway, when you are executing your application inside SGX, you have to intercept all the communications and this is done transparently by the, the runtime, then it's not difficult to wrap this communication inside TLS connections. And then this TLS connection, something that uh, it's been called uh, network shielding, could be actually using spiffy IDs on the outgoing connections and checking for spiffy IDs on the uh, incoming connection. So in a way you have a transparent adoption of uh, spiffy identities. So um, in our integration, we have uh, four main components. So we have the server. As I said, I assume the server is running on a trusted uh, environment. We have the workload registration process that includes the, a name, a name of a session, and the session is what is how we call the configuration of an application. And the configuration of the application, it describes not only the, the executable, but also the state of the file system that supports that execution. Okay, so these are the, the selectors. And here on the top of this slide, you can see 
uh, an example of registering uh, a SVID for one workload that has a specific uh, session name, so configuration name, and the hash of that uh, configuration. Then we need another component, which is the helper. And, and this name helper and the logic uh, behind it comes also from the discussion that is now happening on the community for the serverless uh, infrastructures. Because this helper will be close to the server and will receive some SVIDs that it's capable of managing and then pushes these SVIDs to a store, to a secret store. And in this case, it's an SGX secret store. So finally, we have the workload, which we run in a, in a node that doesn't have an agent. And the, the workload wakes up and gets uh, its uh, SVID, its identity, from the SGX secret store. And then it can use this SVID for those things that it always do. And finally, we have this as, uh, attestation helper, which is the, the, the role of that voting enclave that is necessary for the SGX uh, conversation to provide evidence uh, of the, the code in the platform. So here's a, a, a flow of the, the process. So what you have here is that, for example, in step one, the developer uh, provides the configuration of his application. He says, oh, my application uh, has this and this configuration files, this and this environment variables. And this is also stored in the, in the SGX secret store. Next, in step two, the, the operator or some, someone else will register the workload associating the hash of that first configuration to a SVID, to a SPIF ID, right? So once the association is created, then the SPARI server will start minting the SVIDs based on that, uh, that ID. And this uh, SVID will be propagated through the helper to the secret store. Then eventually the uh, operator will deploy the, the workload. And when the workload is deployed, the, as it starts, it will transparently uh, talk to the attestation service and to the secret store and then get access to its uh, SVID. So in our case, we are using a, a, the certificate, so the X509. And one thing that is interesting here is that this conversation is transparent and this vid can appear as an environment variable that can only be seen within the, the enclave or even a file in the file system that doesn't actually exist. It's just seen by the application when it's running inside the enclave and it has already been uh, attested. So once the workload has the, has the identity, it can talk to other services as usual. So I have here a short demo for you. I hope you can see my screen and it's not too small. Um, so here I have a terminal that I'm going to use to trigger the Spire server. So nothing special here. Then uh, here I want to get the bundle. Uh, here I want to trigger my helper, which is actually a variation from the agent. So we started with a, an agent and make it, made it a, a helper. So it's joining the server with a, a join token. Then um, next, what I have here in these two terminals uh, is the service that is composed of a very simple uh, resource that's not protected. And in front of it, I will put a ghost tunnel, okay? So before I put the ghost tunnel, I should uh, register uh, SVID for the ghost tunnel. Then I can start my ghost tunnel. Here on the top, I have my uh, terminal that I'm going to use for the uh, SGX workload. So as I said, uh, you, the, the developer would submit this uh, configuration, which is called the session, and has some information in the file system. And once 
uh, he does that. So here's the, the hash of this, of this session. Then this hash is needed to register the workload. So let me get, actually I should do the hash. So I will export it as an environment variable for my command to be a bit more readable. So now I have the session. Now I can create my, not this one, not this one, this one. I can create my uh, Spiffia identity using that session hash and just one in here. So with this registration, now I could, I could just use my uh, SGX workload and run it. Then what happened now was that my SGX uh, workload was able to get this feed from the, the local store and also got, uh, got this text message that was served by this application, right? If I would go, was going to try to get this directly, of course, I would not be able to because my uh, ghost tunnel uh, would not allow it. So I could do a few things more. For example, I could uh, change the configuration. So this is the configuration where I set the hash of my executable, what is it going to do, uh, environment variables. And if I change anything here, that would mean that the that the, the hash of this session, this configuration would change and this would not execute anymore. But I did already uh, use too much time. Let me just come back here and thank you. Uh, give some thanks to uh, the guys that contributed. So Mateus has been uh, recently active in the community. We work together. I also would like to thank to Gustavo and Nigro from uh, HP for some feedback. Christoph Fetze from Scontain, so the, the maintainer of uh, Scone. And also I got some very uh, interesting information from Ivan uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I would be very happy to uh, answer any question. And uh, just let me take a look. At yeah. the chat. Andrea, I, I think first question is, uh, what would you describe as the stage of this work and whether this is something you plan on open sourcing or not? So this, the, the plan is for this to be open source. So the, the sh very short term step is to, uh, to open the, the proposal, so the request for comments. And, and then uh, this code is now on a private Git, but it can be open. We just need to refine it a bit more to also short term. And of course, I would like to hear from the, the community around this uh, approach that we are using as a mimicking the, the serverless uh, helper, push helper approach. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Roughly by one, it's, it's hard to answer, but roughly what timeline do you anticipate this to be available in open source? So I would like to create this, this issue for discussion within the next week. And this, uh, this, proof, uh, this proof of concept could be out there uh, in um, two, three weeks. 